Welcome to Great War Story. I have a special episode for you today because I'm going to introduce to you my second World War I obsession. Up until now, I've only been talking about things connected to my grandfather. This is the first time I'm going to talk about Second Lieutenant William Joseph Francis. He was my great uncle. In the photo, you see the woman standing behind the man in uniform is my grandmother. Now, she has appeared in a number of other episodes because she is the one my World War I grandfather, the one who got shot through the face. He was to marry her. She lost one of her brothers in World War I. Now, how did this obsession begin? Well, he was not in the New Zealand Army. He was in the British Army. And I have to confess, I knew next to nothing of him. We had a family tree that gave me his full name, William Joseph Francis. I knew he lived in London, and I knew he was an officer, a junior officer, nobody important, and I knew that he had been killed. And that is a complete summary of everything I knew. However, sometimes the National Archives will have military files for World War I British soldiers. The reason I say sometimes, unlike the New Zealand archives, is because a warehouse holding a lot of these files was bombed in the Blitz in World War II and burned, so a lot of British Army records have been lost. And while I was researching my New Zealand grandfather, I was just browsing through the, um, the National Archives website, thinking, well, there could be a record relevant to the New Zealanders. I wonder if there's anything there. You know, leave no stone unturned. And so I thought, well, let's see if they had a file for somebody called William Joseph Francis. I didn't have much hope. So my first search result was this guy. Royal Air Force Records. Airmen's Records. No, I think that didn't look very likely. Then I had one here. Medal card for William Joseph Francis. Uh, says he was in a London regiment. It says he was a private. That doesn't sound exactly right. But when you look a bit further down, it also says he was a second lieutenant. So that struck me as a possibility. And then what I think was the same man, or at least I thought at the time, here we had a second lieutenant, William Joseph Francis, the Royal Fusilier, City of London Regiment. And... Um, Okay, so it's got the right name. He's a junior officer and he comes from London. It's not an awful lot to go by, but that seemed to be my number one possibility. So I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. I wonder if it would be worth getting his military file. Now, I went and looked for it and it said, this record has not been digitized. If you want to get it, it will cost you. Well, I didn't put it like that. And it turns out there's a two-step process if you want to get a file from the UK National Archives. First, you have to pay... Oh, it's about eight or nine pounds. I haven't checked on the website to see the current price. Eight or nine pounds for a record check. Now, this does not get you the file. All this gets you is a um, somebody goes through and sees if the item physically exists and works out how many pages there are. So I thought, oh yeah, worth a go. So I paid my eight pounds and a few days later I got an email back saying, yes, we found the record. It is 80 pages long. If you want to get it, you can pay, what was it? It was three pounds a page if you want color photocopies. One pound a page for black and white photocopies or digital copies for one pound a page, but still 80 pounds. And at first, at first thought, I just thought, oh, nah, that's not my main research anyway. And uh, who knows if it's even him and 80 pounds. Goodness me. And so I left it for a few days, but I kept coming back to it. And I thought, uh, uh, what would my wife say if she knew I paid 80 pounds without even knowing exactly what it was. That's quite a lot of money. So I thought about it a few more days, but these record requests expire in two weeks. So if you don't say yes, and you change your mind later, you have to pay another eight or nine pounds for 
them to do the same record check again, which seems kind of stupid if you ask me, but that's how it works. So in the end, without telling my wife, I paid the £80 and then bit my fingernails because first worry, is this going to be some random stranger that has no connection to me? Second worry, what's going to be in the military file? It might be boring. What if it's just 80 pages of, you know, the regimental role, every single name of every soldier who was in the Royal Fusiliers or something boring like that? I had not really ever looked at a British Army military file before. I was pretty familiar with New Zealand ones, but I didn't know what I was going to get. So I wait. And a few days later, I get an email saying, well, your file has been scanned. It's ready to be downloaded. And I downloaded it. And this is a screenshot of what all of the pages look like. I mean, and obviously you can't read them, but it's not in any particular order. It's not in chronological order. It's just, I don't know, random, random filing system of the British War Office. And I had to work my way through it. Most of it's in handwriting, some of it in truly terrible cursive handwriting, and try to work out if there was anything interesting or worth paying attention to here. And it proved to be a gold mine. Well, first off, and most moving as far as my family is concerned, here is the telegram that every family dreads receiving. To Francis, 41 Frederick Street, Gray's Inn Road, WC1, that's an address in London. Regret, 2nd Lieutenant W.J. Francis, 11th Royal Fusiliers, missing March 23rd, no details known. Well, perhaps it's the second worst. Of course, the worst is he's dead. But missing, no details known, well, okay, you can hope he's wounded and missing. You can hope he's a prisoner of war. Um... I'll tell you right up front, he wasn't, he was dead. But it would take a long time for them to confirm that. And then, as I said, there were some terrible examples of cursive. And I'll give you what I think was one of the worst. If you, As you're staring at the screen, um, I don't know how much you can work out. I have spent a long time poring over this, so I will give you the benefit of all of that time. Father has had a postcard from a 2nd Lieutenant J.P. Cruikshank of the same battalion, now a prisoner at Gardens, West Prussia, stating that Captain H.W. Brooklyn, 2nd Lieutenant Francis's company commander, who was also in same camp, says that Francis was killed in the forenoon of 23rd of March 1918. Now, there's a lot there to unpack, but I'm not going to do it right now because there are, well, quite a number of future episodes to be made about the different aspects of this military file and other things I uncovered about the story of Second Lieutenant William Francis. The family called him Willie, by the way, but I think I'm just going to call him William or Francis. So I'm not going to unpack every detail. This is really just my overview of my research and the story of William Francis. I will come back and deal with many of these details, such as what is this Grau Dens, West Prussia? And then there's another letter here. Well, this isn't so much a letter. This one is just some note taking by one of the doctors in one of the hospitals. He had interviewed a private and first off at the top of the page, he had written down some notes that he took as he was talking to him. And at the bottom of the page, he wrote down a direct quote of what the soldier had said. And I've given you a little bit of it here. He saw the body, which was badly mangled, death being caused through explosion of a shell. Second Lieutenant Francis's face was not disfigured in any way, and he could be easily recognized. Now, the underlining is there in the handwriting. And this is very important because what's going on here is they're trying to determine if he's dead or not and these are the details they have to hear it's not enough to you know it's not hearsay or oh, somebody else saw him dead or oh, i saw him go over the top and he never came back or oh, i saw a body there and i think it was him these are not good enough so he saw the body and he could be easily recognized these are the essential details and here's the quote the record number the military 
num- number of Private John J. Goodman, 75554, and he was in the 11th Royal Fusiliers, and he stated, I saw 2nd Lieutenant Francis, who was in command of my platoon on 22nd of March 1918, lying dead, again underlined, on the evening of the same day near St. Quentin, death being caused by the explosion of an enemy shell. I was doing patrol duty at the time, and rendered assistance to two of my comrades who had been wounded by the same shell as killed 2nd Lieutenant Francis. Well, I mean, quite moving in some ways, trying to get a picture of what had happened and getting the details about how my great uncle died, but it wasn't as simple as that. Oh, and there's the signature. Private John Joseph Goodman, 11th Battalion, Royal Fusiliers, and also C. Briggs, I think that's Surgeon Major, Royal Army Medical Corps, and there's also a witness, Al Rawls, Captain, Royal Army Medical Corps. Now, it actually started to turn into what I would call Cold Case 1918, or possibly not CSI Miami, but CSI Great War Story. Because within the file, there was completely contradictory eyewitness evidence from somebody else. And, well, there was so much in the file. As I said, a lot to unpack here. Now, William Francis's father was also called William, so he's William Francis Sr. That's why they called the son Willie, to differentiate him from his father William. And he, all he knew was his father, his son was missing. He didn't really trust this testimony. And in these pages that were written by William Francis Sr., so that makes him my great-grandfather, the father of my grandmother, he talked about his private investigations. He talks about going to the hospital and meeting with Private Goodman and interviewing him, showing him a photo of the son, that the William, William Francis, and writing to the war officer saying, I am convinced that whoever it was that Goodman saw dead wasn't my son, and he was entirely mistaken. And, uh, well, so he was clearly doing his own investigations, the crime, if you like, the murder of his son. Well, I mean, we don't generally call death in war murder, but it is deliberately killing after all, isn't it? And then there's this one from, that's the home address of where they lived. Sir, in regards to 2nd Lieutenant W.J. Francis, 11th Royal Fusiliers, since submitting the postcard received relative to my son's death, that's the one from Cruikshank that I read to you, since submitting the postcard received relative my son's death, I have had the enclosed letter come to hand from Switzerland in response to inquiries made. This only seems to confirm the mournful news previously to hand. After perusal, I'll be glad if you'll return the enclosed to me, yours faithfully, William Francis. Addressed to the Secretary, War Office, Casualty Department. So right now, he's up to the point he's trying to get the War Office to just honestly confirm that his son's dead. There's a pension to be paid. Um, he was married. He had a widow. Um, that money couldn't go to the widow until he was officially ruled as dead instead of just missing. And so he, he's been digging. He's been digging a lot. And this letter from Switzerland. Well, of course, I assumed it was the Swiss Red Cross. It wasn't. But that was my initial and I think natural false assumption. And here you can see at the top it says copy because clearly they request they followed the request of my great-grandfather they looked at the postcard typed up a copy of what was on the postcard and then gave it back to my great-grandfather and it came from some place called maison saint jean zeitzers grisson switzerland dated 7th of august 1918 dear sir today we receive word from paderborn in an official note dated july 31st that Lieutenant Wilcox says he himself has no positive information about your son, Lieutenant Francis, but that a certain Captain Brooklyn knows for certain that your son fell at Fussy on March 23rd, 1918. Now, I'll tell you right now, that's a spelling mistake. It's not Fussy, it's Jussy with a J. I'm guessing the handwriting on the postcard wasn't clear enough, and and I sympathise, trying to deal with the cursive, they misread it and thought it was an F, but it was actually a J. I regret that no further details are furnished, but there would seem to be not much doubt about the second fact, i.e. he's dead. 
allow me to express to you my most profound sympathy with you and your family, joined with my most fervent prayer that God will console, comfort, and bless you in a very special manner for this veritably supreme sacrifice which you undoubtedly made and now ratify. Very faithfully yours, H. Walmersley, S. I. As I said, my first assumption was it was Swiss Red Cross, and I was thinking the SI must be some kind of rank. My second, and since that doesn't exactly look like a Swiss name, not German or French or Romanish, um, I uh, thought, well, maybe he's like a British liaison officer sent to Switzerland. None of those things proved to be true. I thought, well, maybe the address will give me a clue. Perhaps that's where there are one of these internment camps. And I will make an episode in future about this, because sometimes the Germans would actually allow injured allied prisoners to be released into custody in Switzerland. They had to remain in Switzerland, um, but like family could visit them there. And it was basically like a neutral country internment where things were a lot more comfortable and the food was better and so on. And they often got housed in the tourist attraction type places like Interlaken and some other beautiful places like that. Um, but that was also a false assumption. And, uh, after a lot of digging and actually talking with, with a friend of mine who used to live in Switzerland, um, he commented that I in Latin is often the same as a J. And that was the proof, cr the crucial clue, because once I started looking for him un with under S J instead of S I S J, it was the society of Jesus better known as the Jesuits. And once I started hunting for a Jesuit called Warmlessly, I found him. He was, well, you had the captain general of the Jesuits, who was the number one Jesuit in the world, and he had six assistants. Uh, so second rank Jesuits, if you like. And Warmlessly was the, was one of these, one of the assistants. Assistant doesn't sound very senior, but actually it was second, second rank Jesuits. And, uh, on a family holiday, I managed to arrange for us to actually go by that address. You can see it's a rather nice facility. And that actually became the headquarters of the Jesuits because the captain general of the Jesuits was a, a relative of the Austrian royal family. And with Italy being on the side of the Allies, the Jesuits felt it might be a bit delicate for them to remain in Rome. So they moved to neutral territory. This property was in fact owned by the Austrian royal family, which is why it was available to them. And this was for a while during World War One, the headquarters of the Jesuits. Um, when we visited it, it seemed to be under construction. They seemed to be turning it into apartments. Um, it was also a fascinating building because later on, it actually housed the, uh, the last empress of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And I believe that's where she died. Um, also astounding to me was it's not a tourist attraction. There was not even an historic plaque. If I hadn't known what it was and where it was and, and studied the maps and looked it up so that we could make a stop while we were driving through eastern Switzerland, you would never have known it was there. It's not even very visible from the main road. You have to walk up the hill a bit. Quite astonishing to me. And I'll probably make a whole episode about the Jesuits later as well. And so other things that were there, I, you know, my great grandfather, you, you know, you've seen, I'm a bit obsessive and like to chase down every possible Avenue. Well, I think you can see a bit of where I got it from because this guy was hunting high and low for any information about his son. He had contacted the Swiss red cross because maybe they had been notified by the Germans that he was a prisoner or was wounded, or sometimes even that they'd identified dead bodies. Now, this International Red Cross has done something absolutely wonderful for researchers. They have an enormous number of card files of all of these kind of inquiries that were made from all different countries. And they have digitized them all and they are freely available. And I was able to find the record card. Unfortunately, they didn't keep the letters themselves. They got the essential information off the letters and then threw those away and just kept the records. But I guess they had to handle all this information somehow. No computers, etc. And here's the record. An inquiry about Francis W.J., 2nd Lieutenant Royal Fusiliers, missing 23rd of March, 1918. Um, who inquired? Mr. William Francis, the father, 41 Frederick Street. Yep, that's where they lived. Um, and then that thing negative 
On the 24th of May, no information. They haven't heard anything. And then the next entry, not yet reported on the 29th of May. In other words, they had to write back and say, we're sorry, we haven't heard anything at all. Now, if you're interested in researching this kind of thing, this is a screenshot from the International Red Cross's um, place for searching for the prisoners. You see, you put the name, you put the nationality, you put the status, and you can go search for them. I mean, there's a lot of records there, as you can imagine. And I actually found uh, records for a number of other people. And there's a few other names I was looking for. We've already had a list of them. There's that guy, Cruikshank, who was writing to my great-grandfather saying, oh yeah, I spoke to Captain Brookling. He said he saw William die. So, okay, who's this Lieutenant Cruikshank? Who's this Captain Brookling? And we've all already in that Swiss letter had a reference to uh, Lieutenant Wilcox. Who's Wilcox? So you can see already that this was growing and growing into another major research project. And then we have another letter here. Copy. Fernside, Princess Road, Wimbledon Park, 8th of no, but there's two dates on it, which is interesting. It's 8th of November 1919 and October the 3rd. Because what we have here, in the handwriting of my great-grandfather, we have a copy he made of a letter that was given to him. So the original letter, I believe, was written on October the 3rd, and then he made the copy which he sent to the War Office in November. And here's what was in this letter that was given to my great-grandfather. Dear Sir, I have this day received a letter from my son, Captain Brookling, Military Cross, in answer to my letter regarding your son. So, and I know from hunting around, what's happened here is my great-grandfather has heard that this Captain Brookling knows something, the war officer said, well, honestly, if we go through official channels, it'll be slower than if you just get Captain Brookling's father to write to him directly and ask him if he's heard anything. Usually that you get a reply faster than going through official channels, which already I was finding incredible. So there's all this mail going back and forth between family in England and men in German prisoner of war camps. This was completely not what I thought it would be like, but this is exactly what happened. He co He got the father of Captain Brooklyn, to write to his son. And, uh, and here's the reply that came back from that German prisoner of war camp. My son wrote, I am sorry to say that 2nd Lieutenant Francis was killed about two hours before I was captured. He was shot through the head. Francis did splendid that day. He was a fine and gallant officer, and I liked him immensely. Give my deepest sympathy to his people. Yours truly, William Brooklyn. P.S. He said Taylor and Knott were also killed, I expect, as they were, um, crossed out, are not prisoners. So, we've got a few things to unpack here, don't we? As aside from the fact that I now want to chase down who's this Taylor and who are these this Knott that are being referred to. But, you see what I'm saying about this being a bit of a cold case? We have contradictory eyewitness statement. We have that private Goodman saying, oh yes, he was my platoon officer and I saw him blown up by artillery on the 22nd. Um, his body was badly mangled, but I, his, he was clearly recognizable. His face was, un, you know, his head was untouched. And now we have Captain Brooklyn saying, no, it wasn't on the 22nd, it was on the 23rd and he was shot through the head. Um, and he says, I was his company captain and he was one of my junior officers serving directly under me and I, I knew him. So what's going on here? And the war office had a lot of trouble dealing with this as well. We've got both of them are saying he's dead but they're saying different days. I mean it, it might not seem like a great deal but it mattered to them. And by the way this is one of the fascinating things for me to realize just how much care and attention they paid these kind of things. We have this impression in World War I that individuals didn't matter. It was just one giant sausage factory. You know, you pump a 100,000 men into the battlefield, they all die, so you pump another 100,000 in and they all die. And you put another 100,000 in and sooner or later you've lost a million and, okay, send another million in to die. That's the impression we always get, that it's just one giant, soulless, impersonal catastrophe of thousands upon thousands of casualties. And yet in this file, again and again, you see such careful attention. It's not just 
my family investigating it, the war office as well, is saying, well, we've got these statements, but this guy didn't see it, and I don't know if we can really accept this, and and it really, really matters. The fate of each individual actually mattered. Well, let's keep going. And then, in the file, was what arrived a little bit later, not too much later, but the war office was right, official channels were slower, a piece of Red Cross stationery, German Red Cross stationery. This is a, from the German prisoner of war camp, and it's an evidence form for prisoners in Germany, or in German hands, to fill out, which could be sent via the Red Cross to the British authorities. And the crucial details on this form are, on the form it says, was he killed outright? Brooklyn has written, yes. The form asks, and by whom was he buried? Brooklyn writes, the enemy overran the position a few hours after his death. Consequently, he was not buried by British troops at all. Can the witness state the names of other witnesses? Several men near must have seen, but unfortunately I cannot state any names. So we have eyewitness testimony, but the eyewitness it'd be nice if the eyewitness testimony actually agreed with the other eyewitness which it doesn't this is why as i said it's a it's a cold case it's a murder mystery so this got me digging i wanted to understand exactly what was going on in the battlefield and this is a scan from the official one of the maps in the official history showing what was happening Um, the broader context is this is part of the german spring offensive the russians have been knocked out of the war and the germans have one shot to try to break the Allies on the Western Front. The Americans are starting to arrive, but they aren't there yet in big numbers. So they can bring all their divisions off the Eastern Front and outnumber the British and the French on the Western Front and try to smash them before too many Americans can arrive. This major assault, called Operation Michael, began on March the 21st, 1918. Um sometimes called the Kaiserschlacht, that's what the Germans called it, the the Emperor's Battle or the Kaiser's Battle. Um, The Spring spring Offensive more generally, and this particular attack, Operation Michael. And their plan, the Germans that is, was to smash into the most southerly point in the line held by the British, um, just north of where the French picked up. I guess they figured where the two different armies met was a point of weakness. They would hit the British and smash them out and then roll them into the sea, break them apart from the French, and, well, their hope was to thereby basically cause the whole front line to unravel and give them one last roll of the dice to try to win the war. And initially it worked rather well they did actually smash the british front lines they got the big breakthrough that everybody wanted in world war one and then i wanted to find out well what were the 11th fusiliers doing this battalion from london with which which, um, included my great uncle where were they and by the way those soldiers in the photo actually are from the 11th fusiliers city of london regiment so you can see when the at this massive attack smashed into this part of the line the 54th brigade of which the 11th royal fusiliers was a part were actually in reserve off the front line and i've you can see at the very bottom left you can see there was the 11th battalion rf that's the royal fusiliers and the 6th battalion northamptonshire um, and then there were the 7th bedfords there were three battalions in the 54th brigade they had been pulled back for a bit of a rest and the front line up here, you can see at the top of the map, that was the front line of defences and that was the second line of defences. And I'll go in other episodes to give you more detail exactly the breakdown of what happened in that area. But basically there was nothing left of the front line after the German artillery barrage. They just walked through. There was some quite bitter fighting at the second line, but by that stage the British defences were already fragmentary and in trouble and they were thrown back. Now, of course, in the confusion, they didn't know what was happening. So the 54th Brigade were received orders to get up there. They got on buses and they were transported up as reinforcements to help the front line. And I've added these myself to the map. This line that I've put there with these arrows, that shows the maximum point of advance they reached 
um, on the, I think it was the, was it the day of the attack? I think the, on the 21st, yes. And at that point, it became a, obvious to the uh, commanders of this area, General Goff was in charge of the F- British Fifth Army, that the front line ha- had been smashed and the general orders were given to any surviving units to get back behind the Crozat Canal. This is the dotted line that was running down the map. That's the Crozat Canal. And the 54th Brigade, and particularly the uh, Fusiliers, were given this section here, this black line I've put behind the canal, that runs between the village of Jussi, and there was a railway bridge north of Manessis. Um, Oh yeah, there's the railway bridge. So the 11th Fusiliers were holding the left part of the line, and I think it was the Northamptonshires who were holding the railway bridge, and the Bedfords were a little bit to the right. So that's the geographical area where it went down. The Germans start on the 21st. By the 22nd, they've reached the canal, and on the 23rd, they assault the canal, and so was it on the 22nd or the 23rd that William was killed? Now... I wanted to see just how much detail I could get. It's just one man dying. Again, normally when you're studying World War I, you're not telling individual stories. You're talking about battalions, regiments, divisions, armies. How much detail could you get about one individual person? Now, because on the 23rd, the British third line of defense that was trying to hold the Crozat Canal... They were completely overwhelmed. Um, My research revealed after I'd started to really look into the battle that by that stage, the British were outnumbered roughly by a factor of 10 to 1. Uh, The Germans attacked everywhere along the canal and they broke broke through in a number of points. Uh, The British defences just could not hold at that point. Now... Oh, and by the way, this photo on the right actually shows a captured British major. And and as I will reveal in a future episode, I actually know exactly who those Germans are. I even have managed to ID some of them from one of their regimental histories and photos in it, like that tall, thin guy with a skeletal face. I've got a name for him and everything. Um, There's also this interesting controversy I got into with a bunch of guys in an online forum about who that captured British major might be, but we won't get into that right now. What matters, though, is that British soldiers, as far as the British uh, British officers, I should say, were not supposed to surrender, or if they did surrender, they better have a damn good reason. That was the reasoning of the British army, anyway. So if you were captured you were under suspicion of having, you know, been dishonorable and not done your duty. So every officer who was who surrendered, when they were eventually freed, was required to be investigated and to be exonerated. Basically, it's guilty until found innocent. And the f- procedure was that they had to fill out a form called circumstances leading to capture. And I'd only learned about this when I was trying to research these all those guys who were in the German prisoner of war camps and trying to understand how they could communicate so freely back and forth. And I came across this information and that had me thinking. The 11th Royal Fusiliers were shattered. They were overwhelmed and there were many casualties and many men taken prisoner. And I was able, using Ancestry.com, to a assemble a list of officers from the 11th Royal Fusiliers who were taken prisoner. And I thought, if I can get their military files, if I'm lucky, I can find the paperwork in each one of those files, circumstances leading to capture. And I did. And here's an example of the kind of thing you could find. This is the circumstances leading to capture form of temporary captain George Stanley Percy. He was captured on the 23rd of March, 1918, in a support trench near Jussi. Well, that's the battle I want. That's the unit I want. If wounded or otherwise, state. He was wounded. He was in Company D of the 11th Royal Fusiliers, 54th Brigade, 18th Division. All exactly the right time and place. 
repatriated on the 3rd of December 1918, date of arrival in England, 10th of December 1918. Present address, uh, some place in North Liverpool. Statement regarding circumstances which led to capture. Having been in action, well I can't do a Liverpool, ac- a Liverpool accent, so I'm just going to just do a generic accent. Having been in action since the 21st of March, I was ordered on the afternoon of the 22nd to take my company from reserve to support position. I saw Captain Brooklyn, A Company, and that suddenly told me information I didn't yet know, that A Captain Brooklyn was commanding A Company. Ah, so my great uncle was a platoon commander in A Company. So I saw Captain Brooklyn, A Company, who held front line and disposed my company in a spitlock trench, one foot deep with platoons arranged for counterattack, and saw the men dug in for artillery protection. That evening and early night, Captain Brooklyn asked for all my bombers with bombs, we would call those grenades, but they called them Mills bombs at the time. That evening and early night, Captain Brooklyn asked for all my bombers with bombs, which I complied with, as the front on the canal was very broken ground. My dispositions were all made for counterattack and support, rather than defence. At 3.30am in the mist, I heard heavy trench mortar barrage in our front and stood to. When dawn came, I sent 2nd Lieutenant Cruikshank with his platoon forward to Captain Brookling, as I had no information and was uneasy owing to heavy fire on our right. Cruikshank, he was the guy who sent the first postcard from that German prisoner of war camp saying, oh, I talked to Captain Brookling and he said he saw William was dead. Let's carry on. Word reached me from left that the enemy had broken right through and Major Deacon, C Company, had been killed. Um, What's interesting here is I got Major Deacon's file and found he wasn't killed. He'd actually wandered into the mist with just one messenger with him and walked straight into the Germans and been taken prisoner. But again, fog of war, this guy Percy still believed in December that Deacon was dead, but he actually wasn't. He was another prisoner of war, but okay. And Major Deacon had been killed. I then sent 2nd Lieutenant Hornfeck with his platoon of B Company, who were on my left to protect flank and regain position. Shortly afterwards, he is reported to me as killed, and I only know that the enemy were holding a crook in my trench on left. Captain Brooklyn came from his company HQ with Lieutenant Cruikshank and his platoon, and reported the whole front line given. In reply, he said it was utterly useless to counter, as the enemy had crossed the canal in big force in the mist. I sent Lieutenant Cruikshank to take up a position at Echelon and rear of my right to hold the flank and enfilading railway embankment. The enemy tried to rush the gap on my front and to the left of it and were beaten off with considerable loss. His continued efforts were also unsuccessful. They then used trench mortars on wire and trench. I instructed Captain Brooklyn to take command on the right and proceeded to HQ to report and to get small arms ammunition and bombs of which we had run short. The colonel was not at HQ, but I heard of a small arms ammunition dump supposed to be in enemy hands and managed to get there, but dump only contained Lewis gun drums, full. Um, Fortunately though, Lewis guns and the rifles actually use the same calibre, so if you could empty the Lewis gun drums, you could actually use them for their rifles and for the, uh, the regular soldiers. Going forward with drums, I met Colonel Sidman, who ordered me to hold my ground and told me he had sent Lieutenant Cruikshank and his platoon into the line again. Dealt out ammunition and, taking runner and servant, went to investigate position on left from about 100 yards in rear of my line. You've got to understand at the time there was very thick mist. While trying to reconnoitre the other side of Slight Ridge on my left, the mist suddenly cleared and we were spotted. I was shot in my belt and boot and then through the neck while running forward to regain my trench. Position now materially altered as Germans had excellent command from elevation in front. While being bandaged, Lieutenant Cruikshank crawled up trench, getting his helmet riddled, and reported critical situation on centre and right. Captain Brooklyn crawled from the right and reported we were nearly wiped out from infilating fire from railway embankment, along which the Germans were apparently advancing in force. We discussed possibility of fighting our way back, even against orders, as we were surrounded, but the shortage of ammunition rendered it impossible. So the Germans were on the railway embankment to their right. They were on the, they'd crossed the canal and they were on the raised bank in their front. He doesn't mention it, but the Germans had also flanked them on the left. They weren't quite surrounded, but they had the Germans on three sides. And uh, I'm pretty sure that that's about the time when William was shot through the head. But let's carry on. 
We decided to hold for a rush on our wire. Germans continued to enlarge gap with trench mortars and advanced under machine gun cover. They suddenly stopped fire and waved our men over, which invitation was accepted. We then surrendered. To the best of my knowledge, the time was 1.15pm. After being wounded, I was not able to observe position personally, as I had to keep my head... Oh, it says heard there, but it's a typo. As I had to keep my head between my knees to prevent fainting. Signed, G.S. Percy, Captain. Well... That's a fantastic situation to report. Now, if my great uncle had been killed on any other occasion, I wouldn't have these incredible levels of eyewitness testimony. I actually found seven of these from seven different officers in the same battalion and different companies, different perspectives. And later on, I don't share them here, but I'll share them in future episodes. I thought, well, I've got to find out what's happening with the flanking battalions. So I also got some of these circumstances leading to capture from the Um, Northamptons who were on the right flank and I think I got some Bedfords and then I got some ones from some guys who were in the village of Jussi and I even went as far as going a little bit further on the left flank of Jussi and so on and so on. I found some wonderful ones. I'm only going to give you one more example now though. This was Henry William Brookling. Well he's one of my crucial ones isn't he? He's the one who said yes I saw William die. Place of capture Jussi near St. Quentin. Were you wounded? No. Company. A Company. 11th Battalion Royal Fusiliers. Date of arrival in England, 1st of December 1918. Present address, Fernside, Princess Road, Wimbledon Park, London. Statement. On March on March 21st, 1918, my battalion was ordered from reserve billets to counterattack the enemy. On night of March 21st, we evacuated to the west side of the Jussi Canal, and my command took up a position on the bank of the canal, with the other three companies in rear of me, and an immediate reserve. Ah, so A Company is in the front line, the other companies are behind. My company front covered a distance of approximately a thousand yards, and there were three bridges crossing the canal on my front which were left intact by the engineers, and which I could not get destroyed. During Friday 22nd, we successfully beat off two attacks, but early Saturday morning the enemy, taking advantage of the thick mist and darkness, succeeded in crossing the canal and coming in on my left flank. A portion of my line went, and eventually I was ordered to occupy a spit-locked trench about a hundred yards in rear. The enemy massed machine guns, etc., and endeavoured to push on, but we held him until 2 p.m., About 11am, the Northamptons on my right dropped back, and this enabled the enemy to push down a high railway embankment on my right flank. Thus, both my left and right flanks were in the air. I I walked along a portion of my line, and found we had practically no ammunition left, and we were cut off from the rear, and tactical communications was practically impossible, owing to most part of the trench being merely spit-locked out. Remember, this trench is only one foot deep. The enemy, with vast superiority of fire and men, eventually overran the position about 2 p.m. afternoon of 23rd of March, 1918. H.W. Brooklyn, Captain, 11th Battalion Royal Fusiliers. And what was even better, he had created a little diagram on the bottom of his form to really demonstrate what he was meaning. As you can see here at the top, there's the canal. There's the position A Company was holding, B Company behind D Company further behind, and their C Company in a position as a mobile reserve. Here's the railway embankment that he's talking about over on their right flank, and that's where the Germans were on the railway embankment, flanking and enfilading their position. So if you were in a one-foot trench somewhere around here, and while you've got Germans on front and left and right, of course you're going to get massacred. Now, the brigade commander, he was an old-style professional soldier. He had been in the South African War. He was a, a professional warrior. And goodness me, was he an angry, angry man after this battle. His brigade had been mauled, um, slaughtered is perhaps a more accurate word. And the war diary of the 54th Brigade, which included those three battalions, was scarce scathing in its assessment and goodness me he really has a really well i say toffee sounding upper class english name brigadier general lionel warren devere sadler jackson and what was his assessment 
the disproportionation in casualties amongst the three battalions of the brigade is due. 1. Ignorance on the part of the officers and the NCOs on how to handle troops tactically. 2. Unsound and over-centralised training. 3. Failure to train individually the platoon and section commanders. 4. Failure to dig in at once. 5. Bad discipline in losing tools and arriving with nothing to dig in with. 6. Bad selection of ground to be consolidated, i.e. consolidating along a road or well-marked line. 7. Sorry, no, no 7. Many of the casualties suffered by the 11th Royal Fusiliers and 6 Northamptonshire regiments could have been avoided if the troops, NCOs and officers had been better disciplined and trained. The bad discipline is apparent in the excessive loss of equipment. Battalions arrived on the field of battle with no signalling equipment. The discipline is unquestionably weak and becomes very apparent in the stress of battle. Military knowledge of officers and NCOs and tactical handling of troops in the field is practically non-existent. Well, what you may notice is missing here is any sense of personal accountability. Notice he's blaming everybody, but there's nothing about the failures of the Brigadier General himself. Yes, blaming a lot of other people. And I'll tell you one thing I discovered with further research. He had left the 11th Royal Fusiliers out to hang. He had sent orders to all three battalions to withdraw. The previous orders had been, you stand your ground and you fight and die to the last man. But then orders had changed. But the 11th Fusiliers never got those orders. So the two battalions on their right flank received the orders and they withdrew. That's why their flank was exposed. There was nobody covering the railway embankment and the Germans were able to come across unopposed while the 11th Fusiliers, as far as they were aware, were told to stay put and in the thick mist. They didn't know that the others were leaving and they were left to die. And whose fault was that, if not the Brigadier General? But I'll make an episode about him as well. Now I thought... Well, it's no good just getting the point of view of the British. I looked at all the war diaries. I looked at these circumstances leading to capture reports. I looked at lots of English language reports. And it suddenly occurred to me that that's like studying a chess game, but you're only studying the pieces on one side. You don't look at the moves and the initiatives taken by the other side. I realized I need to find out what the Germans thought was going on. And I found out that there was a German officer who received, uh, was it the Iron Cross, the the most senior medal, like the German equivalent of the Victoria Cross. And he had won his medal, and in fact been elevated to German nobility, for his assault on the village of Jussi. And I was delighted to find out there was an entire biography of him, in German of course, and uh, I interlibrary loaned it, and it It was a very rare book, and it came to my university library. And the instructions were I wasn't allowed to borrow it or take it home. I was only able to view it on the premises of the library. I had to go to a special room, and I was able to sit there and look at it. And, you know, cell phones are wonderful. I could take photos of all the relevant pages, so I could work my way slowly through later trying to decipher the German. As I said, my German is not great. I have some German. And, uh, well, any translation mistakes are, of course, entirely my own. So here we are. General Oberst Jürgen Ritter von Schubert. There he is. This is the German officer, and there's his medal that he won for the attack on the village of Jussi. So this is how the left flank of um, of the fusiliers was um, exposed. And here's my translation. At this point, oh, and by the way, the reason he had a whole biography was because he became a general in World War II. Um, So he wasn't, he was just a, I think a cap, yeah, captain at this point in World War I. But of course, a lot of these lieutenants and captains went on to take senior command in World War II. And he took part in Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. And actually, he was killed when his stork scout plane was forced to let la- to land in a minefield. So he died on the uh, the eastern front. That's why he got a biography, not 
just for what he did in World War One, but I ordered it because I was hoping there would be some accounts of what he did in World War One, and there was a, about a page worth, so it was worth getting. Okay, to resume. At this point in 1918, Captain Schobert's unit, the 3rd Battalion, stormed the Crozet Canal, a feat of arms that is rewarded with the military Max Josef order. Twenty-five years of life have not been able to dampen the spirit of fire that existed at that time, in the positional war of the Western Front, 1914-1918, and during that time the company commander, Captain Schobert, excelled. He remained the same striker who bravely risked death when it came down to it. What memories make the old battle sites resound in him as he returns as commanding general in World War II? Lorraine, Somme, Artois, Mars and Moselle, Aisne, Champagne, Argon. And how does it impact him to once again go to Jussy on the Crozac Canal, where on the morning of March 23, 1918, he and his 3rd Battalion were supposed to be the regimental reserve of the 1st Infantry Regiment? After the failure of the first attack, at his own initiative, he overcame the wide canal. His comrade in arms, Lieutenant Endel, reports, It would have been about seven o'clock. He suddenly says, Third battalion, up! Get ready! Hurry and get packed! At the top of the gravel pit, the captain calls out, Men, gather round! He said, Men, it's really bad at the canal front. The 30th Infantry Regiment and our 1st and 2nd Battalions have suffered heavy casualties. They can't advance. We have to force the passage across the canal and take South Jussie. Under all circumstances, we must reach this goal. Otherwise, our beautiful successes of the 21st and 22nd will be called into question. Anyone who doesn't go is a coward. March! Follow me! On the eastern edge of North Jussie, we came to the canal bridge. We faltered. The heavy damaged bridge could only be crossed via a door and lay exposed to enemy fire. At this point, I got really confused because it seemed to say a door. I mean, that's what the Germans seemed to say. And I kept double checking, is there some other alternate meaning of this German word that seems to say door? Um, One of my colleagues is from Germany and I went to him and said, am I misinterpreting this? Is this does that really say door? Surely I've misunderstood here. And he says, no, no, that's, it does seem to say door. I can't tell you why it says door, but that's what it says. Okay, carrying on. The heavily damaged bridge could only be crossed via a door and lay exposed to enemy fire. Men, get to move on. Everyone leapt after our commander over the bridge into the village. The troops stormed through the roughly 1,200 metre long village street, breaking all resistance by this wild attack. Our sudden heavy losses were paralysing. Captain Schobot rescued the situation by calling out Hazar with all his strength. Everyone joined him and stormed forward. The machine gun nest was taken. An English captain was defeated by Captain Schobot in one-on-one combat. Our sense of victory after this success cannot be described. And if you think this sounds like some comic book or a little bit overdramatic, um, I was to realize as I translated more and more German battle accounts that, goodness me, they absolutely wax poetic when it comes to describing battles. Um, That they, you might think of Germans as being very disciplined and not very uh, emotive, but let me tell you, when it comes to writing about battles, they just go so over the top. Sometimes I'd translate passages and go, seriously? They really wrote that? And yes, this really is the tone. Captain Schubert became, through that act, a knight of the military Max Josef order and henceforth joined the ranks of the nobility. So he now becomes Captain von Schubert as a result of his success there. Now, there were some things about this book that were rather confusing me. Um, it seemed to be glorifying in war and it also had some like you know a couple of swastikas in it which is pretty unusual for a German book and uh, it also had a you know smiling pictures of Hitler it had a photo of Schobert shaking hands with Hitler amongst other things and I'm more I'm reading this the more I'm thinking this is odd this is not what I expected from a German book. You know, Germans tend to be a bit ashamed of the Nazi past. They wouldn't be glorifying this kind of stuff. And then I did what I should have done as a history professor right from the get-go. I went to the front of the book and checked the publication details. And what did I see? It was published in Munich, 
1942 by the publishing house of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, more commonly known as the Nazi Party. Yes, that's right. This book was published in Munich, the heartland of the Nazis, in the middle of World War II. And suddenly it made sense why um, it had such a weird tone. And actually the author of the book was also fated to die on the Eastern Front fighting the Soviets. And this is a photo from the book. And now it kind of makes sense what they're talking about with the door. You can see there was a bridge that had largely collapsed. This photo was taken from the German side of the canal. And you can see there was like this footbridge down the bottom. And when you get up here, it's like one of those old fashioned covered bridges. This would be the door that they would have. To, you know, that was what remained of the bridge. That's what they were talking about with this weird reference to a door. Now, having found that, it whetted my appetite, and I thought, I've got to find the regimental histories of all of the German units assaulting. Now, the division that hit that section of the line being held by the Fusiliers was um, consisted of three regiments. So they were being... They, <laughs> there was one brigade of three battalions that was trying to hold off a German division of three regiments. So you can see here's Jussi on the left, and the railway embankment is a little over here. So we have the 30th Regiment, the 145th Regiment, and the 67th Regiment that are coming against them. And I think it was the 67th who crossed the railway embankment and had those machine guns up on the top. So this was their line of advance. And the reason, actually, I'm making this episode now for you is because I've been planning a trip to France and I'm going to go to all these places and get some photos and perhaps I'll even make some videos while I'm there on site. So before I did that, I wanted to um, introduce you to this topic. So I'm going to be going to Benet and Hennecourt and Le Fontaine and Gibbercourt and Montescourt and, of course, Jussi. And I'm hoping, because these are just farm fields, the farmer won't mind if I walk along the line of the canal and get photos right at the position where the 11th Fusiliers were obliterated. And yeah, as you see, well, there's the line of advance. And with, from one of these German regimental histories that I acquired, and they're all pretty rare and difficult to find, I'll tell you that for nothing, you see here, again from the German side, the Crozat Canal and the battlefield on the 23rd of March 1918. This photo was taken in the place and on the day my great uncle was killed. You can see the, the waters down here in the foreground. You can see the broken ground. They had tried to stack up some wood and things as defenses, but it hadn't been very effective. And that was Captain Brooklyn mentioned having to fall back from the canal side. And then here's another photo of German troops preparing to assault the canal. And this last photo says the regimental staff of the 67th Infantry Regiment in a railway cutting um, just in front of the Crozat Canal on the 22nd of March 1918. So they would have been just somewhere north of the canal as they were sheltering there, getting ready for the big assault on the night of the 22nd, the morning of the 23rd. Now, a challenge I had to face reading these damn German regimental histories was they're all in Gothic text. And this Gothic text is not as easy to read as just the simple font you get on the computers. Oh, no. Um, like, I don't know if you can see very well on the screen, but that first letter there, that's a V. Does that look anything like a V to you? And this is the uh, Bayerischen. So that B-A-Y, does that look like a Y to you? E-R-I-S-C-H-E-N. Um, seriously, I it was like learning to read Greek or Russian. It, this text didn't look anything like it, and as I was translating, sometimes when it didn't make sense, I came to realize that I'd actually misread the letters. So it wasn't just dealing with the German, it was dealing with the blasted font. And let me give you a selection. I had, so, I've got, I can't remember how many I got. I got 12 German regimental histories, maybe 14, something in that ballpark, and so many of them have great accounts. Wait for future episodes, you'll hear more in, at a later date from some of them, but Here's something to whet your appetite. And this picture is from one of those books, by the way. From the 67th Magdeburg Infantry Regiment. Lieutenant Monta writes, 
Z1 armed Lieutenant Dole was ordered to get as close as possible with his guns. This was another passage where I thought, does that really say he's only got one arm? Surely it doesn't say that. Again, check with my German colleague, and yes, that's what it says. He's only got one arm. Okay. This is a one-armed Lieutenant Dole was ordered to get as close as possible with his guns. He's an artillery officer. For hours already, the railway cutting was under artillery fire, and the ammunition depot burned. At the ammunition depot, a wooden bridge crossed the railway on the Jussier-Rimigny road. This wooden bridge, as well as the southern part of the railway cutting, was under machine gun fire, so that no one dared lift his head. At 5.30pm, Dole appears on horseback on the bridge, and behind him his battery in a light trot. The enemy immediately subjects him to the strongest machine gun fire, so that even the wooden railing is shot off. The first half of the battery fortunately made it over before the machine gun fire made it impossible to pass. Therefore, the second half of the battery descends the steep slope of the railway cutting and came galloping back up the other side. We stood about fifty paces to the side in the railway cutting and watched the spectacle, speechless. When Dole got his guns back, he galloped up on the open field, several hundred yards from the enemy machine guns. However, there were some losses. From this position, Dole moved up one or two guns to the canal embankment in the evening. This is when Germans have, have mastered combined am arms operation. They know how important it is to have the artillery right up there with the infantry, and that's what Lieutenant Dole was doing. A little bit more, and this is after the assault, because remember I said they were the ones who got up on the railway embankment? So here is from the German point of view. In the early morning of the 23rd of March, before four o'clock in the morning, individual patrols of the 2nd Battalion succeed in crossing to explore the other side of Lieutenant Kleinschmidt's footbridge. That was a footbridge discovered by Lieutenant Kleinschmidt. Groups and entire companies follow in single file, and finally the whole 67th Regiment is the 1st Regiment of the Division. Inexplicably, the English don't resist at all. A single machine gun, operated by attentive people, would have been enough to thwart any attempts at crossing. Immediately, patrols are sent to the steep slope south of the canal. They can only make their way through the wire with difficulty. Occasionally, they are shot at with rifle grenades. Again, few people would have been enough to throw all the attackers down the hillside with bloody heads. The English seem to have been sleeping or not expecting an attack so early in the morning. Quickly, the patrols and stormtroopers nest into the trenches that are on the raised ground, and soon machine guns are in place. A machine gun of the 2nd Battalion is immediately rendered useless by two shots in the mantle, while two men who are servicing it fall to headshots. Even before it gets brighter, we have heavily occupied the raised ground on the southern shore of the canal. But the opponent puts up stubborn resistance. Individual Englishmen are captured. The rest withdraw. It's not possible to see where they go because of the dense fog, but strong rifle and machine gun fire comes from the front. The enemy trench cannot be far away. The Lieutenant Budel and Officer Cadet Hrulik from the 8th Company attack the trench with parts of the companies, but both fall, hit by several machine gun bullets. Their corpses, pierced by countless bullets, are later found in front of the English wire fence. The rest of the brave men must retreat before the intense fire. When it gets lighter, we can also recognise the English trench. It is about 150 metres away and surrounded by a strong wire obstacle. Any advance is impossible. Every man who shows himself falls to headshots or is wounded. Some people remain with officer candidate Kosman, 20 metres in front of the trench and dig in, covered by the fog. So the firefight continues until about noon. The enemy is in an unenviable position, for behind him, are open fields, which are widely swept by our machine guns from the raised ground of the canal bank. In other words, they can't retreat. They ha they're, they're in these one-foot trenches, and they've got open country behind them swept by German machine guns. They, they have nowhere to go. Meanwhile, the 34th Mortar Company has been informed of the situation. It bravely advances and positions its medium mortars in a gully on the north bank of the canal. It does not take long, and the first mortar shells whiz into the English trench, as well as into the machine gun nests behind. It is a desperate situation for the English, after Lieutenant Kleiner Clefman has managed to climb the railway embankment and to flank the English trench with rifle and machine gun fire. The shock battery also fires its shots over into the English. Soon you see white cloths swinging over there, and now 
There is no stopping. With a hurrah, we go over to the English, who are all gathered together. Lieutenant Kleiner Clefman alone takes 50 prisoners with just a few men. Nine officers, including a captain, and 292 men throw down their weapons. This is the sweetest success that the regiment has achieved so far in the three days of fighting since March 21st. But that still doesn't answer it, because... Francis's body was never found. He's listed today as one of the missing. But I kept digging, because there's always more. And remember, and after I'd got all of those circumstances leading to capture, it suddenly occurred to me there's something I hadn't looked at. I didn't have a true comparison to the military file of my great uncle, because he died. Up until that point, all the files I was looking at were from men who had survived and been taken prisoner. So then I went back and identified a bunch of officers who had been killed in this battle and pulled their files. And I found this letter in the file of Charles Singleton Knott. If you remember the footnote at the end of that letter from Brooklyn, from the German prisoner of war camp, Knott was killed, I expect. Well, I got his file, Second Lieutenant Charles Singleton Knott. And there was a letter, actually there were two letters in there, that proved very informative. And here's what the first letter said. On March 21st, the Germans attacked De Jussi. We were driven back at to Ribemont, and I was taken prisoner there and sent to work at Jussi. While, I, while at work, I saw the body of 2nd Lieutenant Knott and assisted in burying him three weeks after he was killed. The Germans told us they would place a cross on the grave, which was in a shell hole. The eyewitness was... Um, oh, I forgot to put the guy's name in but anyway I had the name on the letter um, so what we have here oh no there it is Private W. Oliver 52781 from C Company and who was it who'd been killed? it was his platoon officer Charles Knott and he had fair hair in 23 so what happened here was the common soldiers, not the officers, but the common soldiers who were taken prisoner, were put into work parties and, and, and often, burial parties. So from this detail we realise that men of the 11th Fusiliers were brought back to this battlefield three weeks after the battle to bury them. Now you can imagine what the bodies must have looked like three weeks after they were killed. They would not have been in a very good state. But... This guy, Private Oliver, was able to at least ID his platoon officer because he helped bury the body. So that gave me some interesting information about how and, well, how and when um, William's body was probably buried. And this guy was in C Company, so less likely that he would recognize an officer from A Company. And the other letter that was in Knott's file was this one. Mr. Turner, dear sir. I'm writing to you on behalf of the men of the 11th Battalion Royal Fusiliers who are prisoners in this camp. We should be glad if you could do anything to get our clothes parcel sent through. We're quite comfortable in this camp and get our baths every week, but a clean change would come very acceptable. A good many are getting their grocery and biscuit parcels through, and the others are expecting theirs every week now. There are quite a lot of us here, and all are doing fairly well. I'm enclosing you a list of men that I have buried in France. They got killed on March 23rd. No doubt you'll be able to let the battalion know of these casualties. And again, we had some ID IDs. Lieutenant Knott, C Company. Lieutenant Taylor, C Company. And again, notice they're all C Company. I guess this guy, again, this is Sergeant Oley, was also from C Company. So they were able to identify the bodies that they were burying of some of their men and they had sent a letter from the German prisoner of war camp so that the families and the war office could be informed. So Private Giles, Private Chorus, Private Mason, and so on and so on. All these men are buried together in France where we got captured. Trusting that you will receive this safely, I am, sir, yours faithfully, Sergeant J. Ollie. It doesn't mention my great uncle, of course, but it's likely that he was one of the other bodies that were buried by men of his battalion, three weeks after he fell. Now, you know, I said uh, this was my obsession. Well, this is just a screenshot of my folder can, and, can, well, and all the subfolders containing my research. You can see all the different German um, regiments and different uh, English units and all, all the different books and transcripts and things I acquired. 
trust me, I have a lot of stories to go. I'm going to return to my New Zealand grandfather and keep going with those stories, but I have a long, long line of stories to share with you, and later on you will hear more about the results of my research into the destruction of the 11th Fusiliers as they defended the Crozat Canal. And one of the places that's on my list of places I want to see when I go to France is the Pozier Memorial. Now, all the graves in the foreground are actually for Australians, I believe, but the, in the background there are all these plaques on the walls, and that is a memorial for the men whose bodies were never found. I think it's just between March and August of 1918, a memorial for all of the men whose bodies were never found. There were thousands of them, and I hope I can find my great-uncle's name. I don't know exactly where on the memorial it is, but I do have a shot of the panel that contains his name. And uh, there it is, 2nd Lieutenant Francis W.J. from the Royal Fusiliers. So I... Um, I hope I can find that when I go there. That's one of my must-see places to visit, along with, well, of course, the village of Jussi and the Crozat Canal. And, well, I don't want to make these episodes too long, so that's all I have for you in my introduction of my story of my great-uncle, William Joseph Francis, and my investigations into how he died. But it turned into a well, a whole research project into the German assault and the British defence, how they, everything, I want to know everything that happened from the 21st when the assault began through to how they took the canal. And also, I didn't like the idea that maybe my uncle and his battalion were incompetent or bad and somehow it was their fault and that's where the Germans broke through. And that's why I wanted to look at the flanks. And I realised there were four critical positions where the Germans succeeded in breaking through. It was like, it's a 10 to 1 numerical advantage. They assaulted all along. Inevitably, they were going to break through. And even if the 11th Fusiliers had managed to hold them, the, the Germans still broke through in three other places. And once the dike is breached, there's no, there was no stopping them. Um, it was a critical position. Also, when I get back to my New Zealand grandfather, um, the New Zealand division proved absolutely crucial in finally stopping the German advance, but that wasn't for another several weeks after the initial breakthrough. And that's where I'm going to end today, so I'm going to say good evening to you.